Tonight we want to continue our verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of Luke, where we are impressed with Jesus Christ, what a Savior. And tonight we want to grasp the importance of spending time alone with God. So let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We've been studying the Gospel, Luke, regarding the power of Jesus Christ. And we've seen Jesus Christ's power on display in the teaching of the Scriptures as he spoke as one having authority and how God used it mightily in the lives of people. We then saw Jesus Christ's power over demonic forces and Jesus Christ's power over disease. And then Jesus Christ's power over nature and making willing believers fishers of men. And then last Sunday, we saw Jesus Christ's power over leprosy. And we previously saw in studying the temptations of Jesus Christ, that though he is God in human flesh, yet in becoming a man, our Savior gave up the independent use of his divine attributes, though he never ceased to be God. And in his humanity, Jesus Christ yielded to the Father's will and walked by means of the power of the Holy Spirit to not only resist sin, but to preach God's word, heal the sick, and cast demons out in those who were indwelt or controlled by them. But we note it also in Luke chapter 4 and verse 42, and we observed it again in Luke chapter 5 and verse 16 how Jesus Christ spent time alone with God in prayer. We read in Luke 5, verse 15, However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Notice, he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and pray. Notice, he got alone, as it were, with God the Father, and he prayed. He communed with his Father, and he made requests very specifically. Because again, in his humanity, he was dependent upon the Father to be enabled by the Spirit to fulfill his role as the Messiah, though rejected ultimately by Israel, and as the Savior of the world in order to die on the cross for our sins and be raised on the third day. Regarding verse 16, Warren Wiersbe writes, He, Jesus Christ, often left the crowds and slipped away into a quiet place to pray and to seek the Father's help. That's a good example for all God's servants to follow. And I agree. And that's why I want to devote our, the rest of our study tonight to the importance of spending time alone with God. And in doing so, what we just read of Jesus Christ withdrawing from the crowds and praying to God the Father was not a rare event, but a regular daily experience that we do, know, do well to note and to follow. In fact, after a very busy day of tiresome but amazing ministry and preaching God's word and healing the sick, Mark chapter 1 verse 35 tells us, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. It was interesting. I noted as I studied this in the Greek today, He went is in the active voice. He departed is in the active voice as well as he prayed. In other words, he chose to do this. And spending time with the Lord, spending time in prayer, is a choice that we have to make. It was interesting also how the word prayed is in the imperfect tense here in the Greek, which means he literally kept on praying. But notice the priority and notice the pattern that we find here. And I say that because this was after a very busy day of ministry. 
But how often do we use the excuse, well, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to read the Word of God. I'm just too busy to pray. You will always be busy in life. When I was in college, I thought it was so busy. But so often it was discretionary busyness. When I got married, I got busier. When you added some kids to the fold, you're even busier. I was talking to someone who retired not long ago. How are you doing? Oh, I am busier than ever. If you are waiting till you are not busy to spend time with the Lord and pray, the next time you will spend that time is when you are dead. Because you will always be busy. It's not a matter of fitting the Lord in when it's convenient. It's a matter of it being a priority. And isn't it funny? We do take time for our priorities. How many of you took time to eat today? How many of you take time to went, go to the bathroom today? We know Peter did, you know. <laughs> How many times, you know, you're too busy to do what? Are we really too busy to spend time with the Lord and pray? While we're in the book of Luke, turn to chapter 6 with me. As we see again the importance of spending time alone with the Lord. Verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went, active voice, this was a choice he made, he went out to the mountain to do what? To pray. It's an infinitive of purpose. It's the exact reason Christ went. He went to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Isn't that funny? You know, my pastor used to say, isn't it funny? Before you got saved, you a lot of times stayed up late into the night, partying, doing whatever. You woke up with a hangover the next day. After you get saved, you become a health nut. And you're in bed at seven. God forbid I actually stay up in fellowship or spend all night in prayer. I need to be a good-looking corpse when I die, you know. And you know how he would say it, too. But he's continued all night in prayer to God. Why did he do that? Because he had some important decisions to make, and he needed to know the will of God, verse 13. For when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and there were many, and from that group, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. You know, could it be in the important decisions of life that we just need to spend more time praying, seeking the Father's will, and being assured so we can step out by faith? And if Jesus Christ needed to do this, how can we ever say we don't have the same need? Is prayer really that important? We see from the example and teaching of our Lord, it's important even regarding praying for your enemies. Look at Luke 6, verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Notice again the importance of prayer. Go next to Luke chapter 10 with me. Luke chapter 10. Where we see the importance of spending time with the Lord in prayer regarding the evangelism of the lost. Verse 1, after these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, besides the 12, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Has anything really changed? Therefore, here's the solution. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Again, we see not only the example of Jesus Christ, spending time in prayer with God, but his instructions for us to do likewise, even regarding the evangelism of the lost. And as I've said before, we need to pray. The Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, messengers with the right message who are willing to serve. In doing so, trusting the Lord to provide even the financial means for that and the opportunities and doors to do that. 
But will we pray to the Lord of the harvest? Is it important to us? God says it should be. Go next to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. The many things to be impressed with about Jesus Christ. Notice in Luke 11, what the disciples asked Jesus Christ to teach them. Verse 1, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to do what? To pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now in keeping with his kingdom message, he will teach them what is traditionally called the Lord's Prayer, which really wasn't the Lord's Prayer. It was the disciples' prayer in light of that kingdom message. But notice again the request. Lord, teach us to pray. I dare say that we need to make the same request. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach me to pray, Lord. Teach Duluth Bible Church to pray. Teach married folks to pray. Teach single believers to pray. But is prayer really that important? Well, Luke 18, verse 1, he spoke a parable to them. The men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. And that word ought is the Greek word day. It speaks of something of absolute necessity. Absolute necessity. It's the word that's used in John 3, 7. You must be born again. John 3, 30. He must increase and I must decrease. John 4, 24. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Acts 16, 31. What must I do to be saved? Luke 18, 1. Men always must pray and not lose heart or faint or give up. Now, I've sought to remind you many times that the Christian life is a supernatural way of life which demands a supernatural means of execution. And the modus operandi for a daily walk with Jesus Christ, we are cognizant of the fact it must all be by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, based upon his finished work and our position in him. In fact, in our Lord's teaching in in Luke, excuse me, John chapter 15, as we think of these daily inexhaustible resources that God has provided for us, having blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Our Lord said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, that's positional truth and anticipation of what would transpire through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and the sending of the Holy Spirit. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away or he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. You were saved and you were cleansed from your sin because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide now in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And here our Lord Jesus is making it clear that we must abide. We must remain or rest where we have been placed. We are in Christ. That is our position and he is our life. He is our resource for everything. God has never asked us to produce fruit. He's asked us to bear it. Verse 6, if, third class condition, you might or might not, anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You see, he's talking again about a believer here, and this is not teaching the loss of salvation. But when a believer fails to abide, he's just like a branch in the sense that he is withered. He lo loses fellowship with the Lord. He retrogresses in his growth. And what do men do with unfruitful branches? Well, they just throw them into the fire and they're burned because they are of no real practical value to them. But the verse I'm really after is verse 7. 
In contrast to verse 6, if, third class condition, you might or might not. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Now we see here in verse 7 three things our Lord emphasizes. Number one, if you abide in me. It is imperative that we remain in fellowship with the Lord, dependent upon Him in light of our position or identity in Him. Number two, and my words abide in you. My words abide in you. And as a result, number three, you will ask what you desire. This is prayer. And it shall be done for you. We have many times emphasized here at Duluth Bible Church the importance of abiding in Christ. Of staying dependent upon him. Hey, Brad. Brad, can you turn that down one notch? Okay. The importance of depending upon him. But what I want to emphasize for our remaining time are these other two things. If my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. And you know what you'll ask what you desire is what God desires because his words abide in you. And what we're seeing here is the two-way street of, of communication. You know, my wife and I have just celebrated an anniversary recently. And over these years, something I have learned, at least to some degree, number one, stay connected, and number two, stay communicating. When you get disconnected, things break down. When you quit communicating, things break down. And this is what our Lord is saying. You see, number one is stay connected, abide in me. Number two, stay communicating. How does God communicate to us? He communicates to us through his word. How do we communicate? We communicate. You can see this is an old PowerPoint, huh? Through prayer. Who uses a phone like that anymore, hardly? And you know, one of the things I love about prayer is God always seems to be on the other line. He always is there to answer. One of the frustrating things is when you call someone and they don't answer. But I want you to know that God is there to answer and to hear what you have to say. We're talking here about a relationship. And I say that because even as I think of the, a relationship, Again, based upon your position in Christ, in light of the cross work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not mechanical. It is not mystical. It is relational. And I say that because many believers tend to make the Christian life very mechanical. You know, just name a sin and lock into spirituality or something. There's no relationship. And while indeed there's a place for a confession of sin, when we fail to abide in Christ, the key to the Christian life isn't being the best confessor in town. The key is learning how to walk in fellowship with the Lord and to walk in the light as he is in the light so we can have fellowship one with another and admitting when we're not. In a sense, we are to inhale the word so we can then exhale by way of prayer in communing with the Lord in a very personal kind of way. And you see, our Lord here is teaching us the importance of fellowship. Now, as we think of being both connected and communicating, isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ could have said, well, I'm depending upon the Father to be enabled by the Spirit to do God's will, but it's been a busy day. I don't need to really spend time praying. 
I'm depending. But the fact is, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what do we have to share if it's not going on in our own heart and so forth? And that is why it is so important to not only be depending on the Lord, but spending time vertically, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, communing with the Lord. Now, what is this called? Well, it's called various things by various people. Sometimes it's called personal devotions. Sometimes it's called a quiet time with God. I've seen one person call it a divine date. Uh, old timers, you read old Bible teachers, they used to call this the morning watch. Now we can enjoy fellowship with the Lord throughout the day, but this is a time set aside to just focus on and communicate with the Lord. And as this, we search the scripture, we see various examples of individuals who spend time with the Lord. Let me just make a few comments in light of our time regarding this. We've already seen the example of Jesus Christ. If you were to go to Luke chapter 10, and you could do this after the study tonight, tomorrow morning, you could read about Mary, who was commended in contrast to her sister Martha. Why? Because she was sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ, listening to his word. You can read about David in Psalm 5, and Psalm 27, where David says, there is one thing I seek over and above everything else. I just want to dwell in the house of the Lord. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to do whatever. In other words, I want to just be in fellowship, communing with my God. You think of Paul when he keeps repeatedly saying, you know, I pray regularly for you. He obviously spent much time alone with the Lord in prayer wherever he was. And then we have the case of Daniel. I'd like you to turn there. Well, I think I might have it up here. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6 and verse 10. After a decree was made that no one could pray to any god except the king, what did Daniel do? Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room specific place, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees, specific posture, three times that day, specific pattern. And what did he do? And he prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now catch this, as is custom since early days. This isn't the first time he had done this. He had done this for years, yea, for decades. In fact, I wonder if he didn't learn it before he ever was cap taken captive and brought into Babylon. Now, as we see these examples, we see some practical elements of this time with God. And to have a consistent, effective time with the Lord, you'll find it helpful to have a, oops, a definite place where you go. A definite place. Daniel had a definite place. Now, I don't know that Paul did. It probably depended. It might have been the synagogue. It might have been the jail. But it does help to have a definite place. Like those of you who do exercise... So you can be a good-looking corpse when you die. You usually have a specific place you go to. You know, Snap Fitness or Anytime Fitness or some place where you go. You have a definite place. You usually have a definite time of day. Hudson Taylor said in his book, Spiritual Secret, whatever is your best time of the day, give that to communion with God. Thirdly, a definite plan to your study time. And I'm convinced this is where many stumble. They say, where do I begin? How do I do this? Let me give you several suggestions regarding personal devotions. And again, you have these on your handouts. First of all, there is 
the old standby, our daily bread. There's a passage to read in it for the day. There is a devotional given, and then you can pray. Now, let me just have a word of caution. The daily bread is becoming more and more neo-Calvinistic. I just want you to know that. And you just have to be very careful. There could come a time when we just don't even use this anymore. Another one is Days of Praise. Days of Praise, put up by the Institute of Creation Research. And again, sometimes you have to spit seed a little bit in these devotionals, unfortunately. Another one, one that I personally like, and I know my wife has used a lot, is by Warren Wiersbe, Praise, Prayers, and Promises. And again, this goes through the book of Psalms, and it tells you passage to read, and then it gives you again some comments by Dr. Wiersbe and kind of a thought for the day. Another one is just reading through the Bible in one year. There are guides online, or you can read, for example, one book every day for a month, or you could read one chapter of Proverbs every day, 31 chapters, you'll be done in a month, and then turn around and read it again. I cannot emphasize enough to you the importance of just reading the Word of God. Another one are some self-study guides. Now, by the way, all these are available in our bookstore, in our racks, track racks upstairs. Uh, George Zeller has written several of these. And what's nice is in these study guides, they have you look up a verse, fill it in, so forth and so forth. Like here's the problem of pride. No one here has that problem, but maybe you know someone has that. Problem of worry. Some of you are too proud to worry. Some of you worry a lot. But this is a very helpful, very helpful worry. The problem of doubt, the problem of anger, the problem of fear. And again, these have proven to be very helpful. And again, they guide you through this. Another one that has proven to be helpful over years is streams in the desert. How many of you have used streams in the desert? Yeah, it can be very helpful, devotional tool in doing so. What do we have next here? Comfort of the Scriptures. Here's another one we have in our bookstore by John Marchbanks. Again, it has a passage of Scripture or a verse, some comments, and some other verses to look up per se. Again, a little lighter, but can be helpful. It's another Day by Day by Charles Spurgeon. Again, be careful. He's a Calvinist, but he's been dead, so, so uh, he's got it straight now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he, again, has some very good things and good thoughts in it. You know, I was predestined to make those comments. So, um, None But the Hungry Heart by Miles Stanford. A lot of people find that helpful as well. Or just studying your handouts from Sunday or Wednesday Bible study. It's a great way. You know, we study this on Sunday, and then Monday we don't even think about it. Why don't you just devote the day after your study to just go through your handouts and think about what you learned and pray over what you've learned. Even for family devotions, I have some suggestions here again. Again, and these are in our bookstore. We have one. These are by Brian Copeland, Growing a Wise Family. This is on the book of Proverbs. Here's good news for the family in the book of Luke. He's coming out with one called The Family of Grace. On Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and yours truly was asked to write a foreword for it. Keys for Kids from Children's Bible Hour. Again, we'll be careful, but some people have found that very helpful for younger children. The Lamb Book. Many of you have seen The Lamb here. Excellent book. How many of you have this or have given this away? A lot of you. Very good. Great with younger kids and going through... God's plan of salvation. Children pictures Bibles can be very helpful to read. Uh, review lessons and verses from Sunday school. That's something that you can do as part of devotions. And I'd really encourage you to set aside some designated time to do this, not only personally, but for your family. And you know, we like to also reading biographies of great Christians and missionaries. And I would really recommend to you parents especially when you have teenagers, to develop a personal quiet time that can help them all their lives. 
Help them to get into that pattern of doing it. Just like you work, you just like you work with them on brushing their teeth, combing their hair, washing up for boys to change their clothes. And so, a definite place, a definite time, a definite plan to your study time, a definite time of praise and prayer. Again, God speaks to you through his word. You respond in praise and prayer as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. What can be helpful in this is George Mueller's recommendation to read and pray through the scriptures, and I will send that to you in email tomorrow. But the essence of it is this. When you're reading through a passage like John 15, Sometimes we read a passage and then we pray, and we don't pray about the passage we just read at all. And I would highly recommend you just take some time to read like John 15 and pray about what you're reading. You can at times confess, at times praise, at times uh, pray specifically in light of the truth of what you've heard. You know, when you, even Jesus said, I am the true vine, you can pray, Father, I just thank you that you're the gardener. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the true vine. And I see in this that I am a branch, that I am in Christ. And I'm so grateful for that. And I thank you that at, at, at times when I've been unfruitful, you sought to lift me up. And times when I've been fruitful, you've sought to prune me. Thank you for your willingness to do this. May I not resist your pruning. And you can just pray right, right through the passage in a very meaningful way. Some people in, like using a journal to jot down your thoughts or a promise or a warning. You can use the monthly DBC prayer list uh, as for family devotions or personal. And for those of you who didn't come early tonight to pray, but you got a, some prayer requests here. Here are some things you can pray about tomorrow. And bring before the Lord. Sometimes you say, well, I don't know some of the names on here. Well, that's okay. God does. A lot of times I'll just say, Lord, I don't know who this person is. But you do, and I'm going to pray for this, 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 that, or, or that. Keeping a specific prayer list and record when your prayers are answered can be helpful. You ever just note that, boy, that prayer was answered right there. Look at it right there. And that's one of the reasons why we even have this time of sharing on Wednesday night. It's to show you the faithfulness of God, the value of prayer. And there, there's another answer to prayer. You can also consider a time of singing and verse memorization, meditation. And that's why you may want to pick up a hymn book from the bookstore. One of the, the younger or uh, young people's college age song books. You say, oh, pastor, you don't know how I sing. This is why it's time alone with God. Okay. Time alone. Now here are four pitfalls to avoid in closing. And I know I've gone fast, but I trust that this will be helpful and you'll go back and look this over. Pitfall number one is the pitfall of routine without reality. And by that I mean going through the motions without the right heart attitude. You don't want to be like what Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day, that his people draw near unto me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And that's why sometimes you may need to begin your quiet time by just confessing to the Lord and getting your heart right with him. Number two is the pitfall of spiritual pride. You turn your devotional time into a bragamony to other people. And become a Christian hot dog. And you judge others based on this. And you even delude yourself into thinking, well, I'm spiritual. I had a quiet time today. Number three, it's the pitfall of missing the point. You see, Bible study and prayer are not an end in itself. It's not a religious duty. Instead, it's a means of enjoying fellowship with God and worshiping Jesus Christ on the basis of grace. So don't miss the point when it comes to this. You know, when you're not enjoying the Lord and you're not enjoying the grace of God, almost everything in the Christian life then becomes a duty instead of a delight. 
So you do the right things, but you're really cranking it out of your flesh because you really are not abiding the Lord and His Word really isn't abiding you. So you're not asking what you will and your Father's not glorified as you really are not bearing fruit. The fourth pitfall is that of thinking that your day is wasted if you miss it. And that's the other side of this. Oh, I got up too late. I didn't spend it. You know, I didn't have time with the Lord. My day is shot. Now, it's true. You do need to check in. Check in early and check in often. You're walking by faith. But if you didn't have time that morning, you can have time later. It's a relationship again. It's not a performance. Let's not turn it into that. Though it is true, when you spend time with the Lord in His Word, you can have what they call in, in bars the uh, attitude adjustment hour. And as you spend time with the Lord, your attitude can be adjusted. We certainly do not want to be guilty of what Revelation 2 said. As Jesus Christ evaluated the church at Ephesus, and what did he say? After commending them for all these things, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. The first love isn't witnessing. The first love isn't ministry. The first love isn't the horizontal. It's always the vertical. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first word. Remember the fellowship you used to have. <coughs> Excuse me. Change your mind and go back and start spending time with the Lord in his word. <clears throat> I think the first works really are John 15, 7. You abide in me, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you desire, and it shall be done unto you. Or else, I'll come to you quickly, and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity tonight to be impressed, not only through the testimonies and time of sharing, about the power of the gospel and the power of prayer. But now through our study, the importance of spending time alone with you, not only staying connected, but staying communicating, abiding in the Lord Jesus and spending time with you that you might speak to us through your word and we might commune with you through prayer as we enjoy all of this by faith. As we cannot see you, but we know the reality of our relationship with you in light of the word of God. And Father, we just thank you so much for your grace. We thank you, Lord, so much for what you did for us on the cross. And now may we learn to abide in you. And Lord, we know if it was critical for you to spend time with your Father while you walked this earth, indeed, it is extremely critical for us to do the same. So thank you for this encouragement and challenge from your word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're over. But it was a good evening. My apologies and thank you. With that, you are dismissed.